Pine forests in the western United States are in the midst of a major catastrophe. An uncontrollable epidemic of pine beetle infestations has swept down from British Columbia, leaving a trail of dead trees in its wake. Entire hillsides of once healthy forest have been wiped out as piles of dead wood accumulate on the roadsides. While pine beetle infestations have occurred in the past, the severity of this current outbreak is unprecedented and may come as a result of our gradually warming climate. We know that the winters have been getting warmer in western North America over the last two decades. We've measured this. And the snowpacks have been getting lower. And this combination of warmer winters and lower snowpacks has sort of a, a one-two punch effect on the forest. On the one hand, it allows the beetle populations to remain larger through the winter, so that in the spring, there's a larger number of beetles to spread through the trees. In the second way, it, it stresses the trees. These trees depend so much on the snowpack to get them through the dry part of the summer. And so when they become water stressed, they become more susceptible to the beetle infection. The carnage from the outbreak creates numerous dangers for the global community. In addition to the immediate side effects, such as the loss of habitat for a number of species and the creation of a massive fire hazard, scientists are concerned that the death of these large tracts of trees could have a disastrous impact on the global carbon budget. Forests uh, affect the carbon budget of the atmosphere through two dominant processes. Photosynthesis, where they bring carbon dioxide in from the atmosphere, and respiration where they release carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. And it's the balance of these processes that determine whether a particular forest is a carbon source or a carbon sink. Healthy forests are generally carbon sinks, meaning they remove excess carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. In these forests, trees remove carbon dioxide from the air through photosynthesis. This process creates sugars, which are sent down to the roots of the tree and used as energy. A number of bacteria and fungi surround the roots of the tree and live in the soil between the trees, feeding off excess sugars and dead material that falls to the forest floor. All of these bacteria and fungi, as well as the roots themselves, release carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere in a process called respiration. As long as the overall amount of carbon dioxide absorbed through photosynthesis remains greater than the carbon dioxide released from respiration, the forest is considered a carbon sink. So when, when beetles come into a forest and, and they kill the trees that are in that forest, uh, one way to think about that is, again, that, that cuts off the, the carbon income of that forest. The trees stop growing and they die. So you're no longer, for a while, they are getting carbon coming out of the atmosphere and into the system, but the microbes are still there and they're still eating what's around and they're going to keep sending it out. They're going to keep spending it and putting it out to the atmosphere. So you have the balance, the carbon dioxide balance between the forest and the atmosphere changing in both directions decreasing carbon dioxide uptake, increasing carbon dioxide loss. And our initial hypothesis was that the, the overall net effect of this would be very large carbon losses to the atmosphere. These large carbon losses could accelerate the rate of climate change, dumping more carbon dioxide into an already overloaded atmosphere. A group of scientists from the University of Colorado have been monitoring the carbon dioxide emission rates in a beetle-infested forest near Fraser, Colorado. We're here in the Fraser Experimental Forest, which is maintained by the U.S. Department of Agriculture and supports research. Um, our experiment is looking at the effects of beetle kill on this forest on the CO2 that's emitted from the soil to the atmosphere. The researchers are taking measurements from a number of plots that were killed during subsequent years of the infestation. This will allow them to create a model that can be used to predict the rates of carbon dioxide loss in a forest in the years following a large trauma. When you have a major disturbance that comes into the forest, like an insect outbreak that removes um, a lot of your trees and a lot of your carbon uptake, um, no one really understands those dynamics and pressures to global change as well as we would like yet. So we're looking into how does the CO2 coming back to the atmosphere change when you've taken the trees out of the equation and they end up dying over time. The Fraser Forest provided the researchers with a good starting point for their investigations. But in order to complete an accurate analysis, they needed to know the exact dates the trees were killed. 
halfway across the state at the University of Colorado's Mountain Research Station, a fortuitous situation provided the researchers with the means to complete their analysis. We've had researchers here for the last decade uh, basically killing trees uh, for different experiments. And so we, we had this natural ex or sort of a fortuitous experiment that we could use where trees had been killed at different times, different stages over the last uh, decade. These trees were killed using a method called girdling, which isolates the needles from the roots of the tree and is very similar to the effects of a beetle attack. Using records showing the exact date the girdled trees were killed, the researchers were able to construct a precise analysis showing how carbon dioxide emission rates will change in the years following an infestation. The shape of this analysis, however, came as a surprise to the researchers and showed significantly lower levels of carbon dioxide emission than they first predicted. One of our major discoveries was that in the first few years after beetles have come in and killed trees, the uh, carbon released from the surrounding soil actually goes down. What we're finding is that the sugars that the tree was transporting down into the ground, when you cut that off, you reduce the ability of the soil microbes, the roots, and everything in the soil to, to respire. And so you're reducing the amount of respiration that comes out. Now, after five to six years, there's a buildup of plant material, dead material, uh, leaf litter, and that seems to drive the respiration upwards again. But it never gets to the point, it never recovers to the point it was before the beetle killed it, at least over the span of a decade. This second dip in the carbon dioxide rates surprised the researchers, who predicted that these rates would continue to rise as more dead materials became available for the soil microbes. So there's less carbon dioxide being released from the soil than we originally expected. And it's quite a bit less than we thought. And so even though the carbon balance may shift to a carbon source, so the CO2 might come out of the ecosystem now, it's not as, it's not as dramatic an effect as we thought it would be. In order to understand the drop-off in carbon dioxide levels, laboratory analyses are currently being performed on the soil from the plots and on the respired carbon dioxide itself. Their aim is to understand how changes in the behavior of the soil microbes might account for the lower respiration levels. If we do these analyses and we see, for example, that the microbes are changing what they eat, which essentially they're gonna to have to do. I mean, if, if you're cutting off that carbon income, what essentially you're doing is cutting off a food supply that they rely on. You cut that off, they gotta go eat something else. We need to understand how fast do they do that, how well do they do that, how big is that change, and, and by doing so, we ought to be able to understand not only what the system we're studying may do, but, but some more general principles um, about what happens in any ecosystem where you change the conditions, you change that food supply for the bacteria, what are they going to do? So, you know, there may be answers there that we can stick into general models that help us predict the future, help us predict, you know, if humans do X, Y, or Z to a given place, what's going to happen to the carbon in that system? And that's, that's part of our goal here is to go after those kind of answers. The signs of climate change are beginning to manifest themselves in the world around us. From the rising forecast to the scores of dead trees on the Colorado hillsides, we are beginning to experience the effects of a growing human footprint on the planet. But with each new discovery comes a better understanding of the impact our actions have. And through that understanding, we can hope to preserve these ecosystems for future generations as well.